Always follow your nose. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is everything you need to know before watching Rings of Power Season 2. A little disclaimer here, we're not going to be giving deep dives into the books or anything like that. We are just telling you what happened in the show to get you ready for next season. Also, I can promise you that I will mispronounce many elvish names before this is over. Where I'm from, people still call it cement, so I'll do my best even though I'm not fluent in elvish. So, let's get started. So the series begins during a time called the First Age, in a land that's called Valinor, or the Blessed Realm. Now this is where Frodo sailed at the the end of the Lord of the Rings. So this is also where the elves live in what's basically eternal peace. One young elf, Galadriel, has trouble getting her paper boat to sail, prompting her older brother to give her this advice. How am I to know which lies to follow? Sometimes we cannot know until we have touched the darkness. Which, trust me, will come into play later on in the season. Now, the peace of Valinor is broken when basically an angel named Morgoth rebels against their creator and brings war to a realm to the east called Middle-earth. A several century long war follows, ending in the capture of Morgoth in the beginning of the second age of Middle-earth. Galadriel's brother dies in this war, so she takes his dagger and leads a party of elves to find Morgoth's servant, Sauron. Now, they search for decades and they finally find an abandoned fortress where only a strange marking has been left behind. Galadriel's troops are sick of this endless search, so they mutiny against her, and then they all return to Linden, the elf capital. Meanwhile, Galadriel's friend Elrond, you know, this guy from the movies, is climbing up the political ladder. Gil-galad, the elf king, convinces him to tell Galadriel and the others to sail back to Valinor as a reward. He's got his secret reasons for this that we'll talk about a little bit later. Then we go to the Southlands, where the war against Sauron was particularly brutal because the people there actually chose to follow this Dark Lord. In the centuries since, the elves have kept a watchtower here, including an elf named Arendir who's fallen in love with a human woman named Bron Bronwyn. Coincidentally, she has a biracial son with ears that we never see, and this kid's name is Theo. The elves have basically declared victory and say that they're going to leave the tower, just as these farm animals to the east start getting sick, and Arendir works out that there's trouble brewing in the east. And we also get to meet the Harfoots. These are migrating folk that keep to themselves and are basically like proto-hobbits. Among them is Nori, an inquisitive girl who doesn't fit in with their traditional ways. Then a star falls from the sky, and in the center, Nori finds a tall, loincloth bearded man. Is it Dandar? Maybe. I bet it's Gandalf. Yeah, well, just before Galadriel enters Valinor, she jumps ship because she wants to catch Sauron and avenge her brother. Galadriel is rescued by other shipwrecked people, and who, most of whom soon get eaten by a giant worm, but the only other survivor is Hallbrand, a kindly lowborn blacksmith who actually bears the seal of a Southlands king around his neck. So Galadriel and Hallbrand are rescued by a man named Elendil from an island kingdom called Numenor. And before I keep going, guys, I want to show you this sweet new My Precious parody shirt showing Gollum as the Nirvana baby grabbing the one ring. And we also have these halfling walking across Abbey Road just like the famous album cover. We love designing shirts like this for you and shopping the merch store is the best way to directly support our channel. Thank you guys so much for watching and shopping. The links are below. So Nori and her best friend Poppy find the stranger and Nori insists on helping him. Meanwhile, the leader of the traveler, Sadak Burroughs, sees strange signs that he takes to be ill omens. Almost like... Like they're watching for something. The stranger has no memory and can't speak any language that Nori understands, and he also has superpowers that he can't seem to control. They work out that he's actually trying to find a constellation. Elrond meets the great elvish blacksmith Celebrimbor, who asks him to go treat with the dwarves so they can get their help to build a massive forge. Now, Elrond is old friends with a dwarf prince named Durin, but instead of a warm welcome, Durin dresses him down. You missed my wedding! Then they take in the beauty of Casa Doom, which we also saw as a ruin in Fellowship of the Ring. Elves and dwarves traditionally don't get along, and it's clear that the king and the prince are both both hiding something from Elrond. Arondir then goes east to find the source of the animal sickness, and he finds a party of orcs digging tunnels. What's an orc? So orcs were once elves that Morgoth corrupted and, you know, turned into orcs. They're stronger than humans, but they cannot walk into the sun. Meanwhile, Theo finds the hilt of an evil sword, but he keeps it a secret. And then he and his mom fight an orc, and that convinces the townspeople that there is a real problem here and that they should go to the elf watchtower for safety. But again, many of the people in this town are awaiting the return of who they think is their true king, Sauron. Arendir is captured and enslaved by the orcs to help dig this tunnel. And we find out that these orcs serve somebody who's named Adar. Then, Elendil takes Galadriel and Hallbrand to Numenor. So here's a little background on this island kingdom. So during that war in the First Age, many humans sided against Morgoth. After he was defeated, they were given an island to rule by the Valar, who were basically angels. Elrond's brother, Elros, decided to forsake eternal life to marry a human woman from this kingdom. And this began a line of kings that goes all the way to Aragorn and Return of the King. But Numenor, in recent years, has harbored a strong anti-elf sentiment. You see, the king had a vision of the city flooding, following the 
arrival of elves on their shores. So elves have now been banned from visitation. Oh, and this guy is an anti-elf politician named Farazhan. He's probably going to be important in season two. At the center of their kingdom is this white tree of Nimloth, which is descended from a very important white tree in Valinor, and it's also the ancestor of the white tree of Gondor that we saw in the movies. Now, the Numenorians believe that when the petals fall from this tree, it's a really bad sign for their people. So, Illendil gets in trouble for bringing an elf to the shores of the island, but he takes Galadriel to this hall of records that was built by Elrond's brother, and this is where she works out that Sauron's mark from earlier is actually a map meant to lead the orcs to a land that they will call their own in the Southlands. This is also where she figures out that Hallbrand is secretly descended from the last line of kings in the Southlands. Now, Elendil's name means elf friend because his family is part of a pro-elf faction on the island. He's also descended from royal blood, but that's not really important this season. Meanwhile, Elendil's son Isildur kind of just lingers throughout the season, like he flunks his entry exam to become a sailor, and then he's working out what he wants to do with his life. Elendil also has a daughter named Erein, who doesn't really do much this season. I didn't even bother to go back and look at how to pronounce her name. Hallbrand is trying to get a job as a blacksmith in Numenor, and after charming some guys in a pub, they get into a scuffle in an alley, and Hallbrand ends up in jail. Back on the mainland, Nori's dad twists his ankle, which in their culture is really bad, because it means that her family is going to be left behind by the others, and they'll only be remembered in a book where they write down the names of the dead people that they left behind. We wait for you. During the ceremony, Nori accidentally reveals the stranger to her people, and then she gets the idea that the stranger can help pull their cart, even though the rest of the travelers do not trust this guy. Back in the Southlands, Adar finally shows up, and it turns out he's one of the first elves who was turned into an orc so he can walk into the sun. And he's also the leader of these tunnel-digging orcs. He's like an orc civil rights leader who just wants his people to have a land that they can call their own. So the people of the village take refuge in the elf tower while their village is overrun. And then Theo decides to go back for food, and he gets stuck behind enemy lines. But Arendir is able to escape, he saves Theo, and then rejoins the others at the Elf Tower. So this is where we learn that this old man really likes Sauron. The beautiful servant, he was lost, but shall return. Remember that for later. We find out that Adar is actually looking for that magical sword hilt that Theo has, but we don't know why just yet. Meanwhile, Elrond is back in the good graces of his friend Prince Durin and his wife, Princess Deesa, who gives us a sweet-ass song break. <laughs> Durin and his father, King Durin, are worried that Elrond is trying to discover Mithril. Now, Mithril is the super strong metal that Frodo had an armor of in Lord of the Rings. I never told him, but its worth was greater than the value of a shire. The dwarves of Khazad-dûm recently found a huge vein of it under their kingdom, but Durin's dad thinks that it's too unstable to mine. But Elrond slowly works out that they're hiding Mithril from him by basically using his elf super hearing. So in Numenor, the king's in a coma, so the kingdom is basically run by his daughter, Princess Muriel. She has a vision of Numenor's destruction, while anti-elf sentiment is stirred up as humans are afraid that elves are going to raise the unemployment rate. Elf workers! Taking your trades! They took our jobs! Galadriel asks Muriel to help her fight the orcs, and then Muriel turns her down at first. After Galadriel breaks into the comatose king's chambers, she touches a palantiel and then sees a vision of Numenor flooding. So she understands why Muriel is turning down her request for troops. That is, until they kick Galadriel off the island and the tree petals start to fall, meaning that the Valar want the Numenorians to fight the orcs in Middle-earth. So they are ready for war as Galadriel trains them. Farazhan has political ambitions to use the war to control Middle-earth, showing us how easily humans can be corrupted when they're tempted by power. Galadriel, meanwhile, makes plans to crown Hallbrand as King of the South, but he's all like, I don't want it. Then he and Galadriel bond some more, and he finally embraces his heritage as king as Numenor sells to war. Nori explains the ways of her people to the stranger, and then we get a fun travel montage with a song. I trade all I've known for the unknown ahead. The stranger even fights off monsters and shows more superpowers that he can't understand or control. But meanwhile, three mysterious sorcerers from the east are tracking them, beginning at that impact crater. Back in Linden, the King of the Elves tells Elrond the truth. Their magic tree is dying, and this magic tree dying means that the elves will also die unless they all go home to Valinor and leave Middle-earth. The only thing that can save this tree is a magic metal that dates back to a legend about lightning striking this tree during a big fight, and that metal is... Aluminum! 
No, it's Mithril. So the king actually sent Elrond to find out about Mithril, and then Elrond basically reveals the metal is real when he tells him that he promised Durin he wouldn't tell anything. So then he asked Durin and his dad, King Durin III, for supplies of Mithril. Meanwhile, the people in the Southlands are having a political debate about whether or not to fight the orcs or to bend the knee to them. And remember, there is still a lot of like pro-orc, pro-Sauron sentiment in this part of the world. So some of these humans run off and bend the knee to Adar and the orcs. But you know, interestingly enough, it turns out that Adar does not care for Sauron and does not even like being compared to him. You are Sauron, are you not? <laughs> The other humans prepare to fight the orcs and they work out that Theo's sword hilt is actually tied to this ancient tower. And get this, the tower was actually not built by the elves. It turns out it was built by the orcs during the war centuries earlier. Adar rallies his troops and they take over the tower, but the humans run back to the village as Adar searches for the sword hilt that we talked about earlier. The humans prepare to fight the orcs in the village and they win, but afterwards they discover that they were actually fighting their fellow villagers in disguise. Had to pay the toll. Meanwhile, Numenor rides to war. And you know what, guys? It is pretty epic. The Numenorians with Galadriel and Halbrand show up, they beat the orcs and capture Adar. And Adar immediately gets her in trouble for calling his people a derogatory name, Orc. You prefer Orc. You can't use that word. Only we can use that word. Hallbrand has history with Adar. You remember me. And Adar then tells Galadriel about Sauron's end goal. He sought to craft the power. Not off the flesh, but over flesh. But outside, the people of the Southlands are hailing Hallbrand as their returned king. All hail! Well, that's nice. Well, not for long, because it turns out that the old man who just loved Sauron from earlier takes the magic sword hilt and uses it as a key. This key causes the tunnels to flood, which destabilizes the volcano, which erupts and covers everything in red volcanic ash. The survivors gather their wounded. Theo and Galadriel find each other, they bond a little bit, and then Isildur is apparently presumed dead. The princess Muriel is now blinded, and Theo is soon reunited with his mom, and Hallbrand is gravely wounded. This wound needs elvish medicine. So Galadriel decides to take her friend Hallbrand to the elf capital of Lenthen, where apparently everybody has really good insurance. The Numenorians sail home, but the princess promises to help fight the evil in Middle-earth. We'll see to it that we make the end worth the price. Come what may. Meanwhile, hundreds of miles away, the Harfoots come across a volcanic rock. My great-grand used to speak of mountains to the south that could spit fire rock. Now, these rocks have burned down the grove where they plan to pick their fruit, so they ask the stranger to use his magic to help. He tries, but he only ends up almost crushing a kid with a tree. So the Harfoots are all like, Nori, tell your friend to leave, he's had too many. So he does leave, but later they see that the entire grove was regrown with the stranger's magic. So Nori goes after him to invite him back. Where are you going? to help my friend. Back at Casa Doom, the Dwarf King refuses to give Elrond any Mithril, despite being offered 500 years worth of gems and lumber. You see, the King doesn't want to mine the Mithril because it's so unstable and he fears that it could actually harm his kingdom. But when Durin Jr. sees Mithril bring a leaf from the tree back to life, he follows after Elrond and says, hey, we gotta go dig out that mine. So they do against the King's wishes. And afterwards, the King is so mad that he strips his son of his royal status. But Princess Deesa talks him up and lays out her ambitions for their future. And to give we will rule this mountain and all others before our time is done. So the king tosses a leaf into the mithril mine where it floats down and hits the Balrog from Fellowship of the Ring. The dwarves delved too greedily and too deep. Meanwhile, Adar's dream is achieved. The Southlands are a land of shadow, where the orcs can walk freely, and this land is renamed Mordor. So the stranger is off on his own when he meets these sorcerers from the east, and they think that he is Sauron. To little men, Noritas. And the stranger is not even convinced that he's good or evil. He's having like a real Iron Giant moment. I'm not done. Then they kneel to him and say that his memory and powers will return. Then the sorcerers attack the Harfoot caravan, burning everything. But the stranger then shows up and turns the bad guys into butterflies. And then his memories come back along with his speech. He tells Nori what he really is. Is that, in your tongue, that means wise one or wizard? So he is Gandalf, probably. And he and Nori leave together to go find the constellation to stop the darkness from rising in the land. Back in Numenor, the king has died, throwing the politics of the nation into upheaval. Meanwhile, Galadriel takes Hallbrand to Linden, where Elrond arrives with the tiny shard of Mithril that Durin gave him. The two old friends reunite, and Elrond apologizes for not believing her about the evil that was overtaking their land. It turns out the king of the elves was sending Galadriel and the others to the west because he thought that purging the land of the war might actually heal their tree. Now, in Linden, Hall 
Paul Brand meets the great Elvis Smith Celebrimbor and then flatters the living hell out of him. The Celebrimbor? He's not here, is he? Well, as a matter of fact, he is. When Celebrimbor says that there is not enough Mithril to forge a piece that will save the magic tree, Paul Brand starts to give him ideas, gives him the idea to introduce other metals to augment the Mithril's power. Instead of making a crown, they opt to make rings because they are smaller, and Celebrimbor says, We are on the cusp of crafting a new kind of power, not of the flesh, but over flesh. And Galadriel remembers that this is what Adar told her that Sauron wanted. Not of the flesh, but over flesh. So she does some research and finds out that there is no King of the Southlands. The line was broken centuries ago, just as she confronts Hallbrand with the truth. Tell me your name. Vampire. That's right, Hallbrand has been Sauron all along. What? He enters her mind to mess with her head, tempting her to join him. Afterwards, he leaves Linden to go to the Southlands, but Galadriel tells Celebrimbor to form three rings instead of two. That way they will balance one another and secretly resist Sauron's influence. She even offers up the metal of her brother's dagger as a key component to the rings, which is symbolic of her letting go of her attachment and her quest for revenge. So the rings are forged, the magic tree is saved, and the elves can stay in Middle-earth. And the season ends with Elrond working out that Hallbrand was actually Sauron. Well guys, that's everything you need to know before Rings of Power Season 2. You can watch our coverage right here on Screen Crush. We're really excited to cover this show for you guys like we covered every episode last season. But do you have any questions? Let me know down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.